This is Reverend Don Lewis, and welcome to another week of Living the Wiccan Life. This week, we bring you another interview with Oberon Zell Ravenheart and Morning Glory Zell Ravenheart. You know, Oberon and Morning Glory have been among our most viewed and most discussed videos here at Magic TV, and it's no wonder why when you consider the formative role they have played in the development of the modern pagan community. In this interview, Oberon and Morning Glory share with us the secret of the unicorns and how they did it. They also share with us many of their new artworks and products. I hope that you enjoy this interview. Hello, this is Reverend Don Lewis, and I'm here at INETS with Oberon and Morning Glory Zell Ravenheart. Mm -hmm. And are you enjoying your weekend here? Oh yes, we're having a blast. We always enjoy this. It's, it's just beautiful. Such wonderful energy, so many people see old friends, family reunion kind of thing. It's um, just one of our excellent opportunities to travel around and to see people and to um, let them see us and to see the beautiful things that we have and make available for our um, pagan and uh, Wiccan and uh, New Age friends. I believe you have some new things this year. That, um, yes, we do. We do. We have, yes. Um, well, a, we have both new jewelry, which is our biggest new thing. We have a gorgeous new Diana piece, which I'm wearing today. We also have um, uh, a, a new uh, Hearn, the Horned God. Um, and you can look down at the jewelry case and see what we are, um, what we have that's all new. And we have them in sterling silver, we have some of our um, Kernunos images in bronze as well as in silver. And we are uh, testing out some really exciting new products and seeing if people are um, interested in getting them from us. We have a, a wheel of the year mandala that in silver that has everything and Oberon can tell you more about that because he designed it. Oh, the Magic Circle Mandala has all the different kinds of correspondences, you know, and you can down to very detailed ones. So it's, it's a really neat little thing, all the correspondences in one little graphic symbol, including the leaves of the Celtic tree calendar on it, that kind of stuff. And um, another thing we've doing this year is we're introducing some new Paleolithic pieces from the Stone Age. These were some of the first pieces that I sculpted were Stone Age pieces because when I decided to start learning sculpture, I wanted to start at the beginning. So I started 30,000 years ago with the Venus of Willendorf and gradually worked my way up so that the more uh, later pieces were chronologically in my career also created later. So I kind of follow back. Right. So we're glad to bring those out. And one in particular is one that we just think is very exciting. I'd like Morning Glory to tell you about. So the piece that I'm the most excited about right now, being able to offer to people, is this Venus uh, figure from Czechoslovakia, uh, from Dolne Vestenica in Czechoslovakia. And this particular image of the ancient goddess of the uh, Paleolithic people was sculpted by a woman who lived 27,000 years ago in a village that was made entirely out of mammoth bones. And the people were mammoth hunters, and she was their shaman. They know that it was her. Uh, she lived outside the village in a little hut um, up on the side of the hill. And in that hut, when the archaeologists uh, excavated it, they found the very first kiln. And in that kiln was goddess images and images like this that were beads that the people wore as symbols of fertility. Um, they look like breasts and a neck or testicles and a penis. So either way you slice it, as it were, <laughs> they are uh, images of the sacred male and sacred female, which is, of course, the oldest religion. They also found um, among uh, her artifacts a portrait piece of her, and it shows her, and she's distinctive because she has a crooked face. She probably had something like Bell's palsy, 
or was born with a, a, a deformity. She was quite an old woman for the time. She was nearly in her 40s. And when they found her body, they, like I say, they know it was her because when they reconstructed the skull, they found that she had um, the, a, a crooked face. So we call her Crooked Fox because she was buried in a very elaborate ceremonial burial under a mammoth scapula and holding the body of an Arctic fox in her hand, which was probably her totem animal. So Crooked Fox was a shaman and she was our eldest ancestor and she comes to us as the only unique, distinct individual to come and emerge from out of the mists of time that far in the past, from 27,000 BC. And we have her That's entire right. village because when she died and they buried her, they abandoned the village. And so the whole thing just simply got buried over by the snows and eventually became subsumed. Soil. And they never went back into her little hut to take out the last firing of her kiln. They left the firing uh, intact. The, the, and that's the, like... The, the bone flutes that she had made are the earliest known instruments, the jewelry pieces. And and that was it for the whole village. And in her kiln firing, they found little pieces of clay that she'd pinched off that preserved her fingerprints. Even. So we know... It's just like, whoa, you know. She, we we have her bones, we have her portrait, we know what she did for a living, and we even have her fingerprints. That's, so that's as an amazing. individual... Isn't that great? So it's just like, one, whoa, what a story. The one individual that, that comes to us out of the past is a shaman, is a witch. Yeah. And we think that is just wonderful. So we so make the set available to people who would like to have it. You know? And you can have uh, this piece, and these two are made with piercings, and you can buy like an extra bead, and you could make your own Paleolithic necklace with the beads and the, the portrait of Crooked Fox, and then you can add like little snake rib bones or, or uh, stones or amber or whatever else you want to make your own Paleolithic necklace. That's wonderful. Yep, so there's a little you ancestral the most magic. Interesting things. And what, what, what I love about, about your whole collection is that it's not just beautiful, but it's educational. Well, that's because the business started, I started the business. It was an outgrowth of um, my goddess collection. And when I would travel and lecture and teach as a goddess historian, all the people that saw the images and could hold them in their hands would get very excited. Oh, I want to buy this. Where can I get one? Well, I happen to have a genius uh, uh, of an artist for uh, a husband, and he made a lot of pieces that we couldn't find any, in any other way. And so um, when I got tired of working in a hospital laboratory, I thought, you know, what I really want to do is be able to travel and teach about the goddess. And um, a friend of ours uh, helped us to begin making replicas. And so that's how we, the business started as replicas. If people would like to learn more about what you offer, where would they go? Well, our website, uh, the Mythic Images website, is of course the place where all of this happens, and that's mythicimages.com. Very straightforward. www.mythicimages.com. And of course, we're also writing books now, too. That's a fairly recent thing, and I think you've got some of those images in your thing there. We do. The, um, the first book I wrote, The Grimoire for the Apprentice Wizard, came out four years ago and has just been enormously popular. It's, it was translated a, a couple of years ago into Romanian <laughs> because the Romani apparently have picked it up and they really like it a lot. So that was our first translation, not Spanish or French <laughs> or, or anything else. And the second translation just came out this year is in French. So well, of course I look forward to many more of those, but the neat thing has been that people have come up to us from different traditions and telling us that they're using uh, the grimoire as a training manual for their group, their tradition, their coven, and that's very gratifying because what I was trying to accomplish with that was something very universal, and to do so, um, we convened the Grey Council, a, a council of the elders and founders of the entire magical community who contributed something so that we would create 
um, a legacy, really, to pass on to the next generation. This is what you need to know when you're starting off on the magical path. No matter what tradition, no matter what culture, no matter what religion you are, if you're taking on the magical path of wizardry, this is what you need to know, and that's worked very well. My latest book, The Wizard's Bestiary, was just pure fun. This was something Morning Glory and I had thought about doing, oh, 30 years ago. When we just first got together, we wanted to do a book of magical, magical creatures, beasts. magical beasts, because we just love that sort of stuff. Unicorns and, right. and dragons and So we were, we were engaged in several years of intensive research in the midst of which we discovered the secret of the unicorn. And we, we found that we had the choice before us of writing a book about unicorns or actually Creating bringing back real live unicorns into the world and so we looked at each other and said well what would you rather read about it or do it yeah and we're the kind of people that like to do it so we did that <laughs> for a long time and it sort of diverted us from the book but in the meantime we kept collecting materials and gathering up stuff and finally just uh, last year I put it all together morning glory has a chapter in it on wonder horses but everything is covered every kinds of magical creatures and from and even cryptozoological creatures. It's got everything from dragons to the Loch Ness monster and from you know from Bigfoot to obscure creatures of Chinese mythology. It's wonderful. But while we're on this subject, I would like you to take this opportunity to say once and for all, for anyone watching, that the, the unicorn horn was not grafted on. No, no, the unicorn horn was not grafted on. No. <laughs> it, unicorns are only possible in animals that they naturally have, have horns. horns. In fact, we just recently had an exciting news article about a unicorn deer being born in Europe, you know, on a game preserve, you know. It's really quite exciting. In Italy. In Italy. In Italy, right. And, um, but but the not... process for creating unicorns, and unicorns were created by an animal husbandry, husbandry technique, it's a technique of shifting the protohorn tissue to cause it to unite into one spot and therefore when the horn grows all of what would normally be two horns on opposite sides of the head grow together as one single medial horn that is massive and grows perpendicular out from the center of the forehead. But you know, the animal is doing this on their own. It's their own horn, it's not taken from somewhere else. It's just a matter of shifting the tissue right after birth before there is any horn actually developed, you know, and it's a it's a fairly simple thing if you know what you're doing because ancient people did this, ancient right. tribal people in Ethiopia and Nepal did this. It wasn't, you know, something very fancy. But the exact process is one of those closely guarded magical secrets through the ages that, we have, just that to was rediscover. lost uh, because of all the wars right. that. Uh, uh, destroyed the right. culture of the uh, shamanic right. peoples that practice this animal husbandry yeah. technique. But the unicorn images that you see on engravings and tapestries through thousands of years represented real living animals. That's the wonderful thing about that it. These were the not secret. imaginary fancy, fantasy animals at all. And so they are authentic. They are absolutely the real thing. And no, unicorns are not horses. They have <laughs> not ever been horses. No. Horses were given fake horns in the Middle Ages to imitate the real unicorns because uh, real unicorns stopped being available for the kings and the queens to bring to their uh, weddings and their coronations because of these wars and the crusades and whatnot. Well, it was armored headdresses. Right. That they they put often on. are fixed with horns. And they know? taught the horses how to fight with a horn. But the horses are the fake unicorns, and the real unicorns are the animals that actually grow horns naturally. Wonderful. All right. Thank you very much. You're I welcome. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank and you. I hope you do too. This has yeah, been just delightful, been and great. it's good to see you out here. It, so. It's always wonderful to talk to you, and, and you're among the most popular interviews we've ever done. Really? Well, that's good to know. Well, that's gratifying. And uh, we also wanted to say that uh, you can see us, uh, you can see uh, Oberon at Starwood this year, right. and you can, uh, we will all uh, be at PantheaCon uh, 2009. Mm -hmm. And I'll be at the San Jose um, next year. The, the Real Witch Festival in New York in October. And various other places, it's hard to keep track of them all mm -hmm. because I'm constantly getting invitations to yes. go places and talk to folks. And for those who ask about my health, I continue to improve. Yeah.
Indeed. Blessed be. Blessed okay, be. blessed Thank be. You. Thank you. I hope that you've enjoyed this episode and that you'll join us again next week for more of Living the Wiccan Life. Until then, may you blessed be. Hi, this is Rihanna. And this is Virginia. And we're here to talk to you about the new store, all the new products we're putting on the store every day. This is a poppy kit. Uh, a poppy kit is meant for healing. It's meant for sending remote energy from a distance. Uh, you stitch together the little man that's in here, and then you fill him in with the stuffing, and then you place beads and other little items that come in with the kit in particular areas that need for her, like healing. This is the wand kit. Inside here, you get everything is in here that you need to make your own wand. We have the stick, we have the stones, we have the feathers, uh, directions, and it's good to go. Uh, all you need is glue. And we've got the new relaxing bath mix, herbs, yeah. sage, lavender sage, and salt. You place it in the hot bathtub, and it's good for two or three baths. Not just one. And then we have, don't eat it. Now we have the new book coming out, Living the Wicked Life. We're going to be, we're taking pre-orders on this book right now. And then of course we have the Ritual and Theory. Available, available at witchschoolstore.com.